Are this and this the same thing? Well, kind of. Come on, smile. If you've been around the block lately, then you've seen one of these on your favorite software VSTs. It's definitely one of my favorite features. Percussion Factory's got it, Playbox has got it, as do a number of other soft synths. Even modern day groove boxes have it. Chance and randomize probabilities. Randomize. Randomize. The random die is a lot of fun to use, and it's often the kind of thing that leads to what musicians like to call happy accidents. Whenever I see that a particular VST has a randomization feature, or several, my interest immediately goes up. So why is that? And could it have anything to do with this? Mm, Satan! On the surface, these two things appear to be very similar. And I would hypothesize that this is partly based on this. If not by intentional design, then perhaps an unconscious one. That's because the design of these are based on this and this. So if I'm going to compare these two things, first we need to understand how slot machines hook you in. Most big casino movies popularize games like craps, roulette, and blackjack. But in reality, if you go into nearly any casino these days, you'll see acres and acres of slot machines. A lot of smaller casinos are actually 100% slot machines. That's because a study in America's gambling capital of Las Vegas showed that the almost 40,000 slot machines in the city earn an average of just under $80,000 a year. Slot machines are essentially the most lucrative item per square foot that casinos can install compared to other games of chance. And casinos don't like taking chances. Every slot machine has this thing called a return to player percentage, which is essentially the amount of money that the machine pays out compared to what it brings in. In other words, if a machine has an RTP of 95%, that just means that for every $100 you spend, you're going to get back on average 95. Slots are basically a losing proposition. But Steve, you say, if you don't play, you don't win because there is that chance that you could win big, like really big. So what is the chance of actually getting a huge windfall off of slots? It's actually pretty terrible, and I have to laugh at Google's response when I posed this question. Gambling is not a good alternative for earning extra cash. Turns out the odds of winning big on a typical slot machine are some of the worst in the gambling sphere, as bad as 34 million to one. So if we know that gambling is bad in the long term, and that it's really just a scheme for casino owners to get rich, why do over a million people visit American casinos every weekend? It's because slot machines are more than just a get-rich-quick scheme. They're also a doom-scrolling scheme. Yep, turns out that slots and your iPhone are both bad for you. That dopamine effect you get when scrolling through TikTok is similar for slots. But with slots, you're not just wasting time, there's money on the line. The risks and rewards are now higher. So when a win occurs, that dopamine rush is pretty significant. Thus, slot machines are like giant iPhones that slowly suck both your time and money away, making casino owners very happy. So if you or I bought a slot machine and put it at the end of our driveways, could we double our collective salaries and become overnight casino magnets? Uh, no, life don't work that way. But here's the part where we segue this video to the musicians in the audience. Because this is a music channel, not a cognitive research for gambling addiction channel. When you, the musician, buy a VST with a random die, you are kind of buying the musician's equivalent of a slot machine. Kind of. And to see how that works, we need to talk about hooks. If you want a lesson in hook creation, you need to look no further than Steve Miller, who was a master of hooks in the 70s and early 80s. For any listeners who might not know Mr. Miller, just go and listen to this album, because pretty much all the songs contained on it have multiple hooks. In fact, the Joker is arguably almost 100% comprised of hooks, from things like the sliding guitar riff to the line, the pompatus of love. What exactly is a pompatus anyways? So I made up the word pompatus. Finding a great hook is essential if you want to get radio airplay. Uh, I mean rack up stream counts. Because the hook is the part we remember. It's that catchy chorus that you can't get out of your head. It's the best part of the song that you want to hear on repeat. And it's the part that releases that dopamine hit we all crave. Or is it? Turns out, it's probably not. Because a bunch of scientists from France decided to study this. And they published this. In a nutshell, this is a study about what happens in our brains when we listen to music. Specifically, what parts of a song get us excited or aroused. 
sometimes even to the point where the hairs on your arm or the back of your neck go up. If you don't want to read about theta frequency or alpha asymmetry, I don't blame you, so I'll give you the condensed version. It turns out that for the participants of this study, the anticipation of their favorite song being played actually produced more dopamine and excitement than when listening to the song itself. The reason behind this seems to be due to the fact that our brains are designed to predict the future in order to survive. Like, we want to be able to anticipate when the panther is going to attack so that we can defend ourselves. Thus, the brain releases dopamine, and hopefully we defend against the attack and survive. Do this millions of times in a row, and with successful breeding, you get hardwiring in the brain, or evolution. Okay, so if it's true that you get a dopamine hit waiting for your favorite song to come on, just like waiting for the panther attack, then you also probably get a dopamine hit waiting for the hook, or your favorite part of the song. Come on, smile. So how does this all tie together? In essence, it comes back to the reason why I, and probably you, like VSTs with randomization functions. It's because we are looking for that hook to write the next big song, get rich, maybe meet a bunch of hot people, drive fancy cars, and, well, you get the picture. We are essentially playing songwriting slot machines as we strum through the presets or hit the random button repeatedly until we find that perfect synth sound and then try to pair that with the perfect drum loop and perfect bass line. And if the theory behind current research is correct, then the dopamine is released as we anticipate hearing a great preset that could be the hook in our next song. So is previewing through a stack of presets or using randomization functions on gear the same thing as playing a slot machine? At the beginning of the video, I said kind of, and that's because I have the following hypothesis. I think that a fair amount of modern day music making equipment has a slot machine element to it. Programs like Arturia's V Collection or UVI's Synth Anthology have tons of presets that you can doom scroll through and the dopamine release in your brain can keep you scrolling and scrolling if you don't actively keep it in check. The randomization function works the same way, except that you essentially get an unlimited amount of presets, depending on how many presets there are. Here is the key difference though. When you play a slot machine, most of the time, all you are doing is hitting buttons. It takes no intelligence or real effort to do this. If I'm sorting through the fill options or random choices on my poly and play, however, I'm actually gauging between what sounds good and what doesn't. Or at least I should be. I'm actually trying to increase my musical knowledge on how a song or a beat should go together based on what I already know as a musician. And the more you do this, the more you hopefully learn as you start to find out why certain kicks hit harder or why the bass and kick are clashing all the time or why you want to pair a fat bass with a thin synth, etc, etc. And you can also broaden your creativity while doing this as well. I can't tell you the number of times I was searching for something like a nice jazz drum break only to hit on something that would fit into, let's say, the trap or hip hop genre, except that it sounded really fantastic in the mix I was using and it totally changed the approach I was going to take with that song, aka Happy Accident. I don't think that this is a bad thing at all. Of course, like anything, if all you do is spend eight hours a day previewing presets and not making music, well, then maybe you should go see someone about that. But for most of us, it's a fun part of the music creation process that hopefully helps broaden our musical knowledge. Here's one final thought. Thumbing through presets, randomizing, and just the general creation of music all release dopamine and serotonin in the brain. And since we like these things, we of course crave more of it. Thus, the constant need to buy more musical instruments. Now, I wholly believe that this is not the only reason musicians buy instruments. I mean, there's the whole gotta collect them all problem and the serotonin rush you get from just buying new things. It's also not the reason I asked my mom for a guitar years and years ago. But with modern day preset machines and giant 10,000 sample packs from Ghost Hack and others, it definitely plays a factor. Why did I buy a 256 gig SD card for my poly and play that I want to stuff to the brim with samples? The first step of recovery from being a stupid person is acknowledging that you are or might be a stupid person. I could go on about this topic some more, but I've got a new preset pack that I need to check out, and those presets don't listen to themselves. I'm curious though to see what your thoughts are on the topic. Hit me up in the comments whether you agree or disagree. Hit that like and subscribe. On, Thanks for watching, and we will see you on the other side of the mountain.